In this video, I'm going to show you a few more phonological phenomena, and I'm going to show you the rules used to describe the processes. We're not going to go through step by step like with the Korean problem video, but I will talk enough about each problem that you can probably go through the steps on your own if you needed to. So I'm going to do three problems in English and one problem in German. The reason I'm focusing on English so early is because we're going to use these English examples to look at other theories later, so covering some English examples that maybe are more close to home for people is probably just a better idea. Okay, the first one is called English preglottalization, and this is a process where word final voiceless stops are preglottalized. So for instance, we don't say map, we usually say something like map, and there is some preglottalization at the end, like cat, lack. You can hear it's not quite the full sound that we're used to, let's say in the word like mapping, it'd be more like map, map, map. There is kind of a quick closure at the end there. So how do we formulate this process? Well, it's a process that targets word final voiceless stops. So in other words, at the end of the sound, it should be the end of the word. So environment basically says at the end of the word. We're also targeting voiceless stops. So I could say something like minus delayed release to get the stops, minus continuant just to really narrow down that these are obstruents we're talking about, and then minus voice to say that they're voiceless. And I'm saying they're pre-glottalized. So if you remember, what is the feature that we use for glottal stops? It's something to do with our glottis. Is it spread or constricted? Well, it's constricted. So what's happening is that these voiceless stops are getting the plus CG feature, or plus constricted glottis feature, when they are at the end of a word. So we could say to capture English preglottalization, we could say these minus continuant, minus delayed release, minus voice are getting the plus constricted glottis feature at the end of the word. And this captures English preglottalization. So that's one phenomena. A another phenomena in some dialects of English, uh, I have it myself in some words, but it's not very common, um, is called post nasal T deletion. And essentially, what we say is t is deleted between n and a stressless vowel. So, what is a stressless vowel? I want to compare something like the word mental with mentality. In fact, these transcriptions definitely aren't the same as how I pronounce it. But uh, two things to point out really quick. The first thing is that this little tick means that that syllable has primary stress. So the word mental men is the primarily stressed syllable, so mental, and mentality, we have the stress on tal, so mentality, and not mentality, it's mentality. The second thing I need to point out is that this sound here, which I didn't write entirely perfectly, uh, is called a flap. So that is the sound in butter in the middle. That's not a d or a t, it's just butter. It is a flap. Same in the word ladder or writer. Okay, so with those two preliminaries out of the way, let's look at how some people say the word mental. Some people say mental. And instead of scientist, they will say scientist. And even though they may say mental or scientist, they would still say something like mentality or scientific. There's no deletion there. And that's because in mental and scientist, if I were to put syllable boundaries in these words, uh, sci, uh, nest, what we see is that after the N, there's a new syllable, but there's no stress on that syllable. In fact, in the word scientist, there isn't even a new syllable there, but a stressless vowel is actually more specific what we're talking about here. So the vowel here does not have primary stress. There is no stress in the vowel nest in scientist. So because there's no stress, we have T deletion. But in mentality, well, after the N here, we have 
a stressed vowel so t is not deleted. After scientific, again, there is no stressless vowel, there is a stressed vowel, so deletion does not occur. Okay, so the rule that we can say here is a deletion rule. So we can say that t becomes a nothing. In other words, t deletes when there's an n before it, and afterwards there is a syllabic sound, so these are vowels, and there's no stress. So I haven't introduced this plus or minus stress feature, but uh, stress is uh, a little bit above the layers of these individual sound features and is part of an entire word or syllable, so it's a larger structure. So stress, think of stress as being a feature that belongs to syllables or maybe even words. So that's what this minus stress is. Okay, so that process describes post-nasal T deletion. And once again, this isn't something that every native English speaker has. This is just something that is widely captured in some dialects of English. Okay, so here is a very common process. And you'll see this in Turkish, German, Russian, and that is kind of a constraint in a way, but we'll formalize it as a rule. And it is a rule that states that you can only have voiceless consonants word final. You cannot have voiced consonants word final. So for instance, in the word bath, we hear it as bat, but with baths, we would hear bede or beda. For train, you would hear something like suk, but for trains, you'd say tsuga. And the question is, well, how do we know that this isn't just the base form and then when it pluralizes, it becomes voiced? Well, typically we do like to use morphology to figure out what the base forms are. And the assumption is that there's some underlying surface form for the word bath that starts out as bad. And then there is a process that when it gets pluralized, the a uh is there and this stays the same. But if it just happens to be at the end of the word, at the end of a derivation, then this changes to t. And some of the easiest ways to see these changes is to put another word immediately after it and see if there is also a change. Uh, but we'll just trust the data set for now. And what's the rule for getting rid of voiced consonants word final? How do we change them from voiced consonants to voiceless consonants? Well, we can just say that any consonant that is word final just has minus voice or it gets the property of minus voice. Now, why didn't I specify plus voice here? Well, because if we target minus voice sounds too, does it really matter? Does it change anything? No, because if a minus voice becomes minus voice, there's no change. If a plus voice becomes minus voice, there is a change. So we don't even need to specify voice because we're saying, look, it doesn't matter what the consonant is at the end of the word. It's just going to be minus voice in the end. So we don't have to specify plus or minus voice in the initial condition, we just need to specify that it's a consonant and it's going to lose voice in the final position. That's final obstruent devoicing. Finally, the one that is closest to home with me is something called Canadian raising. And this is an example I will definitely use again in the future. So uh, we have this raising before voiceless consonants with the sound I. So there is a difference when I speak between the words right and ride, or rice and rise. There's a difference in the vowel there. And what's causing that change? Well, it is the voiceless consonants that come after it. So we have a rule here that I becomes I before minus syllabic minus voice. Now I really should change this minus syllabic to minus sonorant because I want to talk about obstruents specifically. So minus sonorant minus voice. And when that happens, this I becomes I. And we can see this here. So in the example with right, well, this T is minus sonorant minus voice. Therefore, instead of having an I here, it gets raised. While with the word ride, well, this is a D here. This has plus voice. So this isn't part of our rules condition, therefore there is no change, and this is just realized as the regular I in ride. 
Okay, so those are four more rules. Hopefully by seeing these, you understand the process of making rules even more, and you may have learned a couple interesting facts about the English and German language. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I will do my best to answer them.